Okay, what's up, guys? It is a wild, wild west, as Cool Mo D once said here. So, how fast can these lenders close? Well, today we're going to talk to you about how fast lenders can close these days and how fast you can get the keys to your house. Welcome to Sacramento's number one YouTube channel for all real estate news regarding Sacramento and the surrounding areas. So, if that's you, hit that subscribe button and that bell will bring you bi weekly content. We also go live every Wednesday at 5 30. So, tune in, let's get going, and let's talk a little Sacramento right now. All right, bang, bang. We're talking Wild West stuff. We're talking quick closes. We're talking realistically, how long will it take you to close your escrow? So from, from the moment you see it on Zillow, you see it, you make an offer. What are we talking about? What's it going to take to get you the keys and how fast can you get the keys? Aaron, what's up, my friend? What's going on, brother? How are you? Good, good, good. Hanging in there in this hot, hot weather here in Sacramento. So we're talking, okay, we're talking closes. Now, for cash, we all know cash is a no-brainer. Boom, boom, mm -hmm. boom, you can get it done. But let's talk about like the different types of loans. Let's talk about the different types of situation and how long it normally can take you to close. I know that New Way is one of the fastest companies I've ever worked with closing deals. So give us a little bit of explanation exactly what it takes for the different types of loans and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, sure. So um, the, the, the biggest factor in how long it's going to take you to close your transaction as far as your financing goes is going to be whether or not an appraisal is needed. Um, and if you guys check a, a few episodes back, we'd actually talked about uh, how to get appraisal waivers and those kinds of things. But pretty much with the, uh, with the appraisal, if you kind of take that out of the equation, um, as far as timelines go, you know, not all lenders are created equally and not all mortgage brokers are created equally as well. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, you know, when we created new way mortgage, we're a mortgage broker, we have the freedom to work with any lender that we want. Right. Um, and so, although we're approved with lots of lenders, to be honest, we pretty much send all of our purchase business to one lender. And, uh, the reason for this is that, they're the fastest, they're the easiest, they have the best technology. They don't pay the highest commission, meaning that my company doesn't necessarily make the same as if I were to send the loan to somebody that may take twice as long or three times as long. But it's all about the experience for the customer and it's also all about being able to perform, not just on time, but quickly. That's kind of the big difference between when people can get into a contract and when they can't get into contract. And so, when, when you're looking at uh, basically how fast you can close, the fastest that a transaction can close by law is within seven days of your initial disclosure being provided, your loan estimate. So when, let's say that, that we go into escrow today and uh, uh, what we would do is we would email you your electronic disclosures, you get your DocuSign, you, you complete that DocuSign and one of those disclosures is your loan estimate. Okay, so that's day one. If we didn't have an appraisal needed and uh, you know everybody that's involved in the transaction, including the borrowers, the title company, escrow, you know, if, if everybody's kind of pulling on the rope in the same direction at the same time, we can get these things done really fast. Like we've, we've had several transactions close in seven days. Um, however, sometimes, it may take a little bit more massaging with either getting documents from the borrowers or maybe the borrower's employment, or sometimes there's variable things that eat up a day here and there. That being said, if an appraisal is not needed, um, you're only looking at like two to three weeks in, in terms of like what an average timeline it should take to get your transaction close. So like 14 to 21 days maybe. Um, but it is possible to do it in as little as seven days and it happens quite frequently. It just really depends on, you know, everybody kind of, you know, being on the same, the same page as far as, you know, being quick, getting things, you know, turned in fast, picking up the phone, all that kind of stuff. Now, when you're talking, is an appraisal required <clears throat> um, with conventional financing on a purchase transaction, if you're buying a primary residence or a secondary residence um, and you're putting at least 20% down and it's a, it's a single family or a condo, you can get what's called an appraisal waiver, meaning that no appraisal is needed. 
Um, if you don't fall into that box, or for whatever reason, the, the algorithms that decide if an appraisal is needed or not, if, if you have to get an appraisal, then we got to add that, that, you know, that layer into the equation. And, you know, like Mark and I right now, we, we've got a, a transaction where we're like biting our fingernails, like, where's this appraisal? It's supposed to be turned in today. Hopefully it, you know, hits the, the inbox here anytime now. But yeah. um, when, when you got to add in that third party into the, into the equation, um, you know, with the appraiser, especially with the state of the appraiser industry being very backed up, um, they, for many reasons, and I don't go in the weeds, but their, their industry's kind of got a lot of roadblocks in becoming an appraiser. So there's not a lot of new appraisers like joining the business. And then you have high demand between refinances and all these purchase transactions. So you kind of see those timelines, they can move out to where like, you know, if, if we need an appraisal and we can close in like 21 days, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm seeing where when an appraisal is needed, a lot of times you're more in that like 21 to 30 day timeline. But um, that's on on conventional financing. If you're if you're looking at VA financing, same timelines apply as far as like the fastest you could close is seven days. But we're actually seeing VA appraisals being turned in much faster. And the reason for that is basically VA kind of has their own appraisal ordering process and their own approved appraisers. <clears throat> and, you know, for whatever reason, um, we've just been having really great experience with, with that. Um, so I, we're actually closing those faster than some of the other transactions that need an appraisal. Um, on your FHA financing, you got to get an appraisal. Same with jumbo financing. Um, some of the things that you can do in order to basically put your best foot forward to put you in a position to where you can close fast um, is basically our strategy at New Way Mortgage. We do everything that we can up front. So we collect all of your documentation that we think the lender is going to need. We align with you on all of your goals, you know, everything that's going to be accomplished out of this so that when Mark gets you into contract on day one, you know, as soon as the, the you know, the sun comes up, we're able to hit the ground running and, and basically get your, your file moving through the, the assembly line, if you will. Um, other things that, that you may consider um, you know, doing to increase your likelihood of closing fast um, is either putting a, a large enough down payment to where you're in that no appraisal zone. Um, or if you do need to get an appraisal, we have some clients that have opted to basically pay a, a incentive fee, a rush fee or whatever you want to call it, but a sweetener to the pricing for the appraisal to basically entice the appraiser to you know, deliver the report sooner. So there's there's different different strategies that can be deployed to try and speed up the process. But a lot of it just has to do with with being prepared. Um, you know, I, I actually in preparation for for tonight's show, I had kind of pulled up our our most recent analytics. And just to give you some examples. So, um, you know, the average amount of time it takes our company to to get from day one to being cleared to close when no appraisal is needed was 2.7 days last month. Um, so, I mean, as far as time goes, it, it takes us no time. However, if you keep looking through the analytics, it's, there's a lot of obvious reasons why. Um, a hundred percent of our files were sent directly to underwriting when we submitted them, meaning that there were no QC errors. There were no documents missing. Everything was complete so that it just moves right through the system. Um, you know, we had 100% of our files had what, what the lender calls clean submissions, meaning that we provided so much to them that instead of having a conditional approval with like, hey, you guys need to provide us these 15 or 20 items, we average less than five items needed on our on our approval. So a lot of it has to do with really um, having a, a clean file or, you know, a very organized file is another way to look at it, doing a lot of the stuff up front and then also picking a lender that's built for speed versus, you know, maybe a lender that, um, you know, they're, they're not as fast, but maybe they offer a, you know, just a slightly better price. 
Um, you know, a lot of it is all about speed. So that's really what we focus on is the technology and, and working with a lender that basically has, you know, a, a system that's built for moving fast. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we got a question or we got a statement from Johnny, which I love even more. That's awesome, Aaron. Some builder lenders re uh, reviews. I've been reading those builder lenders won't touch file until seven days before closing, scrambling to get all the docs and stressing out buyers. I know that's kind of one of those myths as far as when you go into a builder and they say, hey, go with our lender. We're like this. We're totally in tune and everything too. It, it's only as good as a lender or as a, as an agent is. And, and that's what you have to be careful of. Um, I do want to add some things to what Aaron is saying as well well is number one is if you want to close a deal quicker you have to basically be very reactionive like if aaron says hey i need this get it right don't sit on this stuff and just get them all the documentation they need they can only go as fast as they want or they can if you give them the documentation you have the other thing is don't do crazy things like go out and buy washer and dryers a day or two before you close Save that brand new Maserati for after you bought that home. Mm -hmm. You know, those things send your DTI completely out of whack. And they kind of like all of a sudden everyone's scrambling, gift letters and everything like this. So the idea is being really, really in tune with your lender. Like I tell all my clients straight up, it's, you know, I'm reiterating what Aaron and Jen normally say too, is the fact that like before you spend anything, you buy anything, talk to them during the transaction. It's very much... And that's kind of one of the things I like about working with local lenders like, you know, like Aaron and Jen is the fact that like they're always available. So if like your best buy in that like see through refrigerator caught your eye or you're thinking about buying that jacuzzi, you have them right there to just ba basically talk you off the ledge and say, wait till you close. You got plenty of time to do that. And that's the truth. Like, you know, certain things that you do that you might not think affect the deal really, really do. Um, and so that's why I tell all the clients, you know, just keep in tune with, good, you know, make sure your lender is very like responsive on the phone. You know, the best rate, of course, everyone's kind of looking for that as well, but you need someone to guide you through this because it still is not just a complete easy thing. Oh, now the other thing too, before we get going more in this video, please hit the like button, share this video if you think it'll help people. Like I said, we go live Mondays every 5.30 talking about mortgages, talking about all that stuff. And if you have any questions, if you're you're feeling like maybe you're not getting the service you need from your lender, you want to throw some balls out there to see if Aaron can knock them out of the park, give us a try right now. Like I said, I've worked with a lot of lenders. Aaron and Jen, New Way is one of my preferred lenders to work with. They're local. They're great. Um, and, you know, like I said, um, this is why we do this. So if you have any questions about the industry, if you have any questions about interest rates, where they're going, where they're not going, we can do our best to kind of talk about it. Um, Aaron, let me ask you something. We talked about this over the phone just before we went live about like how they were asking you, how, you, were, you needed to pay the to get the appraisal done or something like give us a little rundown on this. This is interesting. So basically like if, if you go back in time to 2009, right after the market crash, there were some, some, uh, laws that changed in the, in the finance industry that a lot of them affected mortgage, real estate, and one of the things that came about it was, it's called the Home Valuation Code of Conduct, but basically it, it created a middleman company, if you will, a middleman that's between the lender and the appraiser. So you already have a added layer of, of complexity to the scenario where, you know, you got to go through somebody to communicate to somebody else. Um, but what we're, what we're kind of seeing is, you know, and, and I'll, I'm going to, do my best not to upset, you know, the folks in the appraisal business. But what I'm what I'm kind of seeing basically is that they're cherry picking all the easy deals because the way it works these days is if I'm an appraiser, I'm I'm basically like in one of these middleman uh, systems, and I'm probably in a bunch of different middleman systems. And when they get requests from mortgage lenders or real estate agents or whatever to have an appraisal completed, you know, I, I they go through the the uh, AMC's portal and, you know, they kind of pick all the easy reports, basically all the easy uh, properties and all that stuff. And because of the situation that there's just not a lot of appraisers because of essentially the barrier to entry is really, really high. You got to do like a four year apprenticeship and all this stuff to become an appraiser. So there's not a lot of new appraisers. And so because of that, what we're seeing is like, I've got a deal, for instance, this one's not with Mark. Um, this is somebody else, and we're up in up in the El Dorado Hills uh, area, a little bit, a little bit past El Dorado Hills. But 
it's not like a property out in the middle of nowhere. It's right off of the 49. Um, and literally the 49 backs up to the property. It's a little less than five acres. And so it's, it's a very typical property for up there. You know, it's not like a hundred acres or something like that. Well, it's taking a month to get that appraisal back. And that's on top of, we've already paid um, between myself, my company, we threw an incentive in, you know, everybody it's at a certain point just starts kicking in to try and make a deal happen. Um, but between the real estate agent, the client and our company, we've got over a thousand dollars in incentive fees um, on top of the normal appraisal fee, which is typically only like five, 600 bucks. Um, and still we've been unable to incentivize the appraiser to move faster. Um, they reached out yesterday because we were over the weekend trying to get it sped up. They wanted $4,000 um, to be able to provide the appraisal and the timeline that we were asking for. So it's just like some of these guys, I, I kind of wonder what they're smoking, but um, uh, you know, that, that's just something that when, when you're getting into the market and you know that you're going to need an appraisal, something that you may want to factor into your cost of doing business is throwing an extra, maybe 500 bucks or so at the appraiser to, you know, it's not necessarily always needed. However, being prepared that you might have to go down the road of a rush fee, um, in order to basically get your transaction done in a timely manner. Yeah. The other thing too is, and this is something, um, it's also kind of have a, com uh, a good communication with the listing agent or the, if you're the buyer's agent, whichever, which way you are, um, to basically have a good communication as far as like, whenever I'm throwing in an offer and we're doing something like a 21 day or whatnot, I'm like, look, here's the thing. Here's what we can do for you. You, you know, quick close. But as you know, appraisals are what appraisals are. So just kind of keep that in mind and kind of have that a conversation like early on in the transaction. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is anyone who actually has been doing like real estate even a little bit knows that during this time, appraisals are very, very tough. So you have to be realistic. I mean, like, like the funniest part is sometimes like when, you know, you're writing these deals that the, the close, everyone's looking at the deal going, yeah, there's no way they're going to close it, but people write it. So they're just hoping that this little kind of language between realtor, the, the realtor will be able to kind of push it through. So I always believe in having that conversation early, being realistic, getting everyone on the same page, because you really want to kind of do that early on so that you have, don't have an awkward conversation later. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, you know, going with a company that can maybe look out and maybe do an appraisal waiver as well. I mean, that is so huge because as Aaron was saying, appraisals are the biggest delay right now in the market. So if you can actually have an appraisal waiver done, I mean, you know, one more time, Aaron, what do you think? How, how much would that shorten it down? If you had an appraisal waiver, it was a conventional, um, what are you looking at here? It, it, it's going to take your, your timeline down to like seven to 14 days realistically to close your transaction. In fact, when, and, and I'm, I'm not even just making this up to, to, you know, blow up our, our, uh, our ability, but most of the time our team, we find ourselves to where when we don't need an appraisal that our loan documents are ready to be signed before the everybody's actually ready to sign them meaning like the seller's not ready the buyers like everybody's still doing their their contingencies on their or their due diligence they're still doing their home inspection or whatever whatever those things may be <clears throat> and it, and it really just comes down to not needing that appraisal because if if we're doing our job up front like i said that that you know we do a lot of the work up front so we get all of your income documentation your assets all these different things that the lender is going to want and if we turn that in on day one of your escrow um, to the lender for review we're going to have your approval back depending on the time of the day sometimes it's same day but usually you'll, you'll be looking at if you just plan for the worst the next day so if we're looking at on day one, we submit to underwriting. Day two, we have our conditional loan approval. Usually on a conditional loan approval, there's a couple of like boilerplate kind of conditions, but a lot of times it's you need that appraisal and then you're waiting on the appraisal. Well, if we don't have an appraisal that we're waiting on and we've done a good job of, of documenting your income and those kinds of things, then a lot of times we either get approved as we submitted the file or the minor conditions that we're waiting on. Like sometimes it's like a title preliminary report or something from escrow. We get those pretty quickly within the first week of the transaction. 
Um, so that puts us in a position to where we can turn the file back over, get cleared to close, and then it's just a matter of signing the documentation and, and getting your loan funded. So if you can cut the appraisal out of the process, you're going to shave, you know, probably half of the time off of your transaction. Not to mention, you know, you save five, six, seven hundred bucks, depending on, you know, where your appraiser is and, and all that stuff. So uh, if you can avoid an appraisal, that's that's the only way to fly. Oh, I love this. I love this. New Way Mortgage. This is the only way. Mondo, new home buyer. Uh, Cornell, what's up, man? I, I actually, you made me laugh, dude. I, I was telling, I was talking to Cornell earlier about timelines and, and the reason why we choose to work with the lender that we choose to work with. And uh, Cornell is a fan of Tesla's. Um, that's a fine automobile. And I was telling him, you know, working with, with uh, UWM, United Wholesale Mortgage, they're the, the largest, they're publicly traded. They're the largest uh, purchase lender in the country. They only work with mortgage brokers, so you can't call them up directly. Um, but working with them, it's like driving a Tesla, you know, all the technologies there, it's fast. It's, you know, it's, it's real sexy. Whereas and I told him, you know, working with a lot of other lenders, it's like that 1980 Corolla. And, and he replied back and was telling me that that was his first car. And it made me laugh. Cause I actually, that was my first car. I had a tan, like 1985 Toyota Corolla. So that's, you know, I got that burned into my vision. <laughs> God, but fun. What's up, Mark and Aaron? I know, just going live a little bit, talking a little, yeah, Corollas. I mean, Toyotas, you really can't go wrong no matter what era. Mm -hmm. um, um, what was I going to say, though? So how are you doing out there, Aaron? How's everything going as far as your clients, as far as what do you feel, what are you seeing out there in the market as far as that stuff goes? Like how many, your, your usual, what are you feeling? How's the market feeling for you now? I feel like things are picking up. I, I feel like uh, last month, because... You know, there's always that kind of lag between when you start talking to a, a client and when they're actually in escrow and then it's game time. Right. And for a period of time there, there was like a it was like a frenzy of, you know, you talk to somebody and it's like they're getting into escrow right away. And then I feel like the month of July, um, things kind of slowed down a little bit. It was almost like buyers, you know, they had fatigue. Uh, the, the, uh, COVID bans in our state kind of ended on June 15th. So everybody was like free to move about the country. And, you know, there was a lot of that going on where it seemed like consumer focus on buying a house, although it was still really high, it kind of dipped a little bit. Well, now I feel like we're seeing it kind of pick back up. Um, I don't feel that way. I mean, just looking at my, my pipeline and, and what's been going on over the last several weeks, we've, we definitely seen an uptick in uh, purchase uh, applications going into escrow. A lot more people applying. Um, people are, I believe, I feel like they're kind of refocusing on, all right, uh, the kids are going back to school, potentially, uh, you know, here shortly. I got the holidays right around the corner. It would be really nice if I could, you know, spend Thanksgiving in my new house, you know, that, that kind of thing. So I feel like things are picking up as far as that goes. Um, also, you know, interest rates, um, definitely like they, they drive, you know, consumer sediment, right. And traffic. And although, you know, for the last like two years now, it feels like, uh, rates have been at all time lows, but you know, they go up some, they go down some. And for the last few months, we'd been experiencing kind of upticks in mortgage pricing. And over the last few weeks, we've seen pricing improve. So I don't know if, you know, consumers are, are, you know, truly trying to take advantage of the pricing or if it's just kind of a combination of all of the above. But the one thing that I have really enjoyed seeing is that there's more opportunities out there for buyers. There's more inventory. Sellers are becoming more flexible. Um, you know, you just go back six months ago and it was like, you know, if you weren't agreeing to put their kids through college and wash their car once a week, like you weren't getting into escrow, you know, now you, you, you can get away with just washing their car. You don't have to do the college tuition. So it's, I feel like being a buyer, um, you're in a much better position now, uh, as far as you still got really great financing options because rates are super low. You've got more opportunities because we're just seeing more homes become available on the market. And with sellers being a little bit more flexible, 
you know, you can work out a better deal for yourself. So I'm, I'm excited about, you know, the next few months for all of our buyers. I think it's going to be really good. Yeah. I love how it's looking right now. I'm going to call this part of August price drop August. Cause I'm seeing a lot of price drops, reductions, boom, boom, boom. I'm going to tell you why this is exactly why it's happening because there's a lot of agents that are talking to their sellers and saying, we can get you still whatever you want for your house. They missed the boat by a mm -hmm. few months and they're listing too high. And you're seeing all these price drops because the frenzy buyer, they're gone. They're gone. Mm -hmm. And now you've got the buyer who, you know, early the summer was thinking, I'll buy whatever, whatever comes my way, I'm taking it. And now the buyer you're looking at is the buyer that's rested, went on a nice vacation with their family, went to wherever to get their kids all lined up for school, put their kids in school. <sighs> they took a deep breath. They're back on Zillow looking at for stuff. And they're saying to themselves, you know what? If something comes my way that I like, I'm going to jump on it. But if something doesn't, I'm okay waiting. Why? Well, interest rates are still low. Inventory slowly kept coming back on the market and I have a little breathing room. And then mm -hmm. you have the realtors who told that guy who has a house who that'll probably appraise for a million dollars. Let's mil let's list it for a million too. We'll get it for you. They didn't do their research. They missed the boat for probably about two to three months. And now they're dropping it like crazy. And I, Honestly, if you look at Zillow right now, you're going to see price drops here, price drops there, especially in the homes in the Sacramento region, over a million dollars. A lot of people are overpricing that stuff. Now, I'm not telling you if a house isn't amazing, it's still not going to go. But if something is something that you're looking at and saying it won't appraise, I don't know if you're going to get that many offers anymore. I think it's going to be sitting. I think you're eventually going to have to drop your, your price. I mean, that's just what I'm seeing. Um, you know, we have some buyers that we were looking for during the weekend, you know, and I was seeing it. Some of the houses we were looking at, it was like $50,000 price reduction, 50 here and there. And I was like, that is so interesting. And I do think it's because the listing agents are doing their usual spiel. Hey, Bob. Yeah. You got a house. Yeah. And Bob says, Hey, you know what? I'm the only way I'm selling this thing is if like, you know, I can get one, three for my house. They look mm -hmm. on Zillow, they do their estimate. It's really maybe like a one, 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 two house. They're like, hey, Bob, I'll get you that one, three. They put it on the market, the thing sits. So it's going to be very, very interesting these next few months. I would say it's like it's like the merry-go-round spinning, spinning around. Find your moment. You know, interest rates are still low. It's still doable. If you see something that's sitting, if you see something that's good, I would say right now, be a very picky buyer. I would say always be a, be a picky buyer. I would say, you know, this is a big purchase. I would say get your team ready and go and just, you know, if 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 the if the uh, if the property strikes you, I would say you might have a chance, a good, really, really good chance. So it's going to be an interesting market. I mean, that's kind of what I'm seeing right now, which is beautiful, you know? Totally. And, and, and just to tag on to that too, when, and to clarify for the audience, when you say price drops, we're not saying that property values are dropping. What we're saying is that sellers, the asking price that they're throwing out to the market, they're bringing that down to reality a little bit more, but that doesn't mean that like the actual values and homes are declining. They're still- no on the other no, no, no. they're going up but here's the thing like like aaron was saying he's he's right on about that what i'm saying is that you have a lot of listing agents out there who are calling people <clears> basically <throat> i don't want to say false promises but sometimes they're looking at the market what it was maybe three months ago sure. anything you throw online you could basically get whatever you wanted for it and a lot of people are listing high and and you know like you know let's say the house is going to appraise for something like one 1 million, right? They're gonna list for like one one or one two. That's really, really high. And they're seeing those houses sit. Um, and that's kind of what you're running into right now. You have the savvy kind of listing agent who can tell their client, hey, look, let's list low. They're still gonna get some multiple offers and everything. Not as many as maybe three months ago. The market three months ago was super, super hot, super sizzling. Anything, honestly, any house. I mean, I was going out showing houses and these houses were kind of like, half done, right? Floors half put in, you know, it's got the primer white and they're like selling for whatever. And people were jumping on them like crazy. But mm -hmm. now I'll tell you something. It's just, it. There, you know, things are selling for what their value is, or maybe even a little bit above depending like Rockland, of course, still a hot market and all this kind of stuff. But I think you're getting more of the picky buyer and <clears throat> not everything is going to sell just because it's for sale. So mm -hmm. 
it's really, really interesting. Any good stories going on with you guys, though? Any any tales to tell? Uh, you know, nothing, nothing that just comes off the top. I'm sorry. I should have, I should have had that one ready for you. No, man. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Here's one we have, Aaron and I are working a deal with this one guy. We won't go into names, but he is, he was hot for a pool. Right. And oh, so yeah. during the time of the year in Sacramento, it's really, really hot. Right. It's, it's super hot. And now with the Dixie fires out there too, people aren't really going around too much. And it's just really kind of this weird muggy Miami feel outside. And, um, Pools are hotter than ever, though, and it's it's crazy. You know, even my wife was talking to me and going like, are, are, are you – pools? I'm like, no, I'm telling you, it's nuts. Pools can make people do crazy things. And so you look at these houses, and and like I was saying in my video I did a couple of days ago, the fact is like the thing about the pool is like normally pools are a hot commodity during summer in Sacramento. I mean, truthfully, a lot of people moving from the Bay Area are telling me, hey, look, I'm not moving into a house unless it has a pool. I want that resort lifestyle. I'm moving to Sacramento for that. But here's the thing that's even worse compounded on this is the fact that you call any pool company right now, it's going to take you about a year to get a pool in. So, I mean, like for that, pools are super hot commodities. So I'll preface what I said before. I'm like, if you want to throw whatever on the market that has a pool, it might sell. <laughs> it might uh -huh. sell for whatever. Pools are hot though, like in this area. And I think more than not also because a lot of people look like if you have a house here and you're looking to upgrade, a lot of people in Sacramento want to upgrade to a house that has, has a pool. A lot of people from the Bay Area, other areas moving to Sacramento feel the heat. They want a house with a pool. And so that tends to be really, really something in Sacramento that's like coveted, right? The other thing about pool too is, you know, a good pool is going to run you anywhere between maybe sixty and eighty thousand dollars, and it's easier to find a house that has a pool than, or maybe now might be a, you know, this and this kind of thing. But at the same time, it, it's hard to 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 put in a pool and to justify eighty grand pool then of mm -hmm. course you want the outdoor kitchen Aaron and then you want the chase lounges and then you want the nice concrete and then you oh my god it goes on and on I mean landscaping backyards those are big deals here in the Met Sacramento Metro all right on that deal by the way man I'll, I'll point out that uh you know on a lot of these these shows we've talked about different kinds of financing and how uh having conventional financing is is definitely an advantage but uh, on that on that deal that you're just talking about with our client that's getting the sweet house with the pool, FHA financing. And, you know, this is a, a deal where, you know, the reason that the offer got accepted was because of all the communication between uh, Mark and myself with that listing agent and just conveying the ability to to be able to perform. Same kind of thing that we do on the VA transactions and anything that's not conventional. So, uh, you know, don't uh, don't don't count yourself out from being able to get a pool just because you got an FHA loan. Absolutely. And we were on that agent like crazy. She wasn't mm -hmm. even the easiest one to contact. But at the same time, we just jumped on it and stuck on it. I mean, we're yep. talking Rockland with one of the best pools I've ever seen. It's sweet. Yeah, that waterfalls, you know, all that stuff and everything too. like 650 Rockland, four bedroom, two and a half bath, two story with a pool um fire i'll be pit. keeping my eye out for the uh, housewarming invite oh man that, that house is so <laughs> sweet but like i said like Aaron and i kind of dug in i mean i think we we you know saturday night we we're trying to talk to her over and over and over until we got her done but it was it was perfect i mean the truth of the matter is and that's kind of how you have to be for your clients right now you know like i said pool houses are a different breed right now they're they're brutal i mean you'll see a house with a pool and listing agent will have that little cocky demeanor but um but mm -hmm. hey pools are pools here in sacramento it's a big deal okay yep. johnny should someone wait to sell until after fall winter 2021 maybe spring 2022 to get the most money for their house Woo, aaron you want to hit that i'll hit after i i guess johnny my my question would be is like well what what are you gonna do with like where are you gonna go move to because if you're you know if you're just exchanging one house to move into a different house, then you got to factor in. Now, I, I I know that you're looking at that, like the two lots at the Lennar, you know, development out there. But I mean, depending on the price of, of that home, um, waiting even, you know, let's say that you do get a, a higher price, a higher net because you waited. Well, does that also mean that you're now waiting on your purchase? And in so doing that, that the seller of that property is now charging you a higher price. So 
Um, along with something else to consider is where are mortgage rates going to be when you obtain the financing on the property that, that you're buying. Um, so uh, de depending on, on you know, the answer to that, even getting a better price down the road might not actually net you more money. Um, but I do feel that taking advantage of, of the market before you get into the holidays, um, you're going to get a better price. Otherwise, you're going to probably have to wait until like the spring buying season kicks up. Traditionally, at least, um, you know, once the kids go back to school and then Halloween hits, you know, everybody kind of rolls up the sidewalks until like after New Year's Eve. And so depending on your, your timeline there, um, selling during the holidays typically isn't the best time for a seller as far as maximizing your price. Yeah, 100%. I mean, like I said before, I think three months ago, you were probably going to get the most, or yeah, it was a crazy market. I think I think the the houses were going for crazy amounts of money like three, two months ago. I think now, you know, I mean, I think if you got a great house, it's probably going to go for a fair amount. But I mean, I think it will in a few years or whenever you decide to sell it. Um you know, I would say also the idea of renting the house out, I would consider that before even pondering the selling thing. I mean, the rental rates, it's insane when you think you go on Craigslist or go on rent.com for what you can rent houses with. And like, like I always tell people this too. I'm like, you know, like my dad had like his pension, his 401k and all this kind of stuff. But I do think rental income is our generation's retirement plan. And I think that if you have a house that's awesome and you can rent it out, keep the property, you know? And I, I know that goes probably against every realtor fiber in me, like sell, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> but I, I say keep real estate if you can. You know, I think it's a, it's a good way to go. Um, I don't, I think maybe three months ago, I would have, I would have maybe said, Hey, look, maybe sell if you have something to jump into. But I think now, I don't know if you can keep it. I'd say, see what you can get for rental. Um, because at the end of the day, I think if you have like maybe three or four rental properties, that's not bad to be, go stop by the mailbox every month and collect like 10, $12,000. I mean, that's, it's a pretty darn good retirement to be honest with you. And you can sell the houses anytime you want. Mm-hmm. All right, Ron, does pool add value to the house? Uh, how much? Uh, I'd say it definitely adds value. I mean, here's the thing about pool. You know, this is the, these are my rules. These are my real estate rules for pools. Never shop for a house for a pool during summer. Never sell a house with a pool during winter. Those are my those are my realtor words to live by for swimming pools. Um, but I think right now, I mean, definitely. I mean, if you have a house with a pool, the value of that thing is going to be crazy, you know. And I I think that also the thing about pools that can kind of make it more interesting as well is like I don't, you know, I, I think if you put the right furniture out there, you know, the chase lounges, you get a nice barbecue out there, all that kind of stuff. I think, you know, if people bring their kids to see that pool, they're going to go crazy for it. Houses with pools are just nuts, especially during summertime. During winter, of course, not that much, but during summertime right now, I think it's crazy. Now for Ron, I know Ron's looking at a new home. Um, I do think that putting in a pool, like, cause Ron's looking at Toll Brothers. I think putting in a, a pool at Toll Brothers, you're probably looking at something like, cause the thing is the last thing you want to do is have a generic pool at like a house that's like a Toll Brothers type house. So probably looking around 80 grand for a nice pool over there. Um, do I think you'll get your 80 grand back? Probably not. Um, so I would say, you know, that's one of the things about buying new, you'll have to put in a brand new pool. I just don't think you'll get the money back if you put in a pool, but I don't think myself, I would live in a house without a pool, especially in this heat. I mean, I'm wearing a black shirt and I'm inside with air conditioning. I'm still boiling hot. Mm -hmm. All right. Is it better to have a pool or be in a clubhouse? Aaron, what do you think? I, I would, you know, it depends on first off, how many, how much are the dues to be a part of that clubhouse? And then like, are you actually going to be using the additional amenities provided by that clubhouse? If the answer is no, and that you're only going to be using the pool, my personal preference, I don't want to share a pool with a bunch of people or, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd rather just go walk out into my backyard. But if I'm into playing tennis and racquetball and the gym and all the, you know, the kids club and all the different things that, that are available at some of these clubhouses, then, you know, you got to kind of weigh that out, obviously. But uh, I do agree with, with Mark that 
you know, the, the value of the pool, there's a lot of value that is like your perceived value, not an actual like tangible value. And so like as a buyer, you know, I may really want a pool, but the appraiser may not necessarily, you know, give a valuation of $80,000 for that pool. They may only feel like it adds 30 grand in value to the property or whatever. So, um, you know, a lot of the uh, amenities like that, um, are, are, there's a lot of perceived value in that. So it's, you know, if, if you're one of those guys that just really wants to be able to walk out of your backyard and hop into the pool, I mean, that's going to be a whole lot better than having to drive down to the street to the clubhouse and, you know, be around a bunch of other people. But that's just my own preference. Okay. Ron, I know Ron. Ron is a super cool guy. Great family. I'm going to tell you, Ron, for you specifically, this is my advice. You get a jacuzzi for the house right outside. Boom. And you got the clubhouse pool because my buddy Ron is a networker. He loves talking to people, hanging mm -hmm. out and everything like that, Ron. And I guarantee you for you, you're going to love bringing the kids to a nice clubhouse like pool, like Russell Ranch or, you know, like the one at Whitney Ranch as well. Like a nice place like that. Have a cocktail, chill out. The kids are yep. swimming, have the events going on there and meeting some cool new people and everything too. I'm thinking, Ron, you're going to really love the clubhouse vibe there too. Um, as long as you pick the right clubhouse, the vibe you like and everything too. But I think you are a social person, my friend. I think that a clubhouse would work perfect for you. Definitely. All right, Johnny, Aaron, how does rental uh, rental factor in to keep uh, your first home to rent out DTI calculations on a second home mortgage? So basically, if, if, uh, if you're going to convert your primary residence, meaning the home that you're living in right now, you're going to convert that into your rental um, there's a, a couple of different ways to slice it, but essentially, um, the, one way to do it is we would have an appraisal done on your departing residence and that, uh, appraisal would, uh, be a rental appraisal. So they're going to do like a survey of what rents are in that market. And we'll use 75% of whatever that number is to offset your mortgage liability. Um, Let's say, though, that you don't even need that in the equation, like you just make enough money to qualify for both mortgages, then it's it's just a simple matter of, of uh, you know, just making sure that the debt to income ratios work. But we do quite a few of those, especially in in this market. Um, we do a lot of, of transactions where basically the lenders not necessarily if you can qualify for both payments. The lender is not really concerned of, are you going to turn it into a rental property or what are you going to do with it afterwards? It's just, are you retaining it or not? And does that mortgage payment fit within your, your debt to income ratios? If, if it doesn't fit within the ratios, then that's where we look at converting it to a primary res, or I'm sorry, to a rental. And when we do that, um, we would, <clears throat> we would, um, get a basically the lender wants to see a copy of the deposit that the that the uh, tenant has made and they want your uh, first rent payment to be received within 90 days of your mortgage on your new loan starting so basically there's kind of a way to not count your mortgage debt that you've got on your on your current primary against you if you're flipping it into a rental property but that solution isn't always necessarily needed. So it's kind of a case by case basis to figure out what, what's the easiest path to, to get through the system. But, uh, you know, as, as long as, you know, you're able to, uh, to qualify, whether it's with just your income or using the, the proposed rental income, um, there's no reason why you can't do that. Very, very cool. So we got some, uh, do you have any shout outs to do today? Uh, you know, I actually, I, uh, I got a shout out. Uh, I was, I was talking to, uh, Hang Lim earlier today and he wanted me to tell you, uh, that you owe him a bottle of champagne. Actually. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. And I, I gotta go over there. I, I might actually shoot over at Elk Grove tonight. I'm handing keys to, uh, to a person we put into a house tonight. So I might actually swing by. It's, yeah, I owe him a bottle of champagne. Truth cool like, guy, really it. cool guy. But he, he, uh, the he asked guy we were going to be live tonight. He wanted me to give you give you some trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah, he should. He should. And I deserve it. And his story was really, really cool. He was a first-time home buyer. 
we got him into Lennar. And this is back when Lennar was actually playing nice with realtors. This was a while ago. And he was looking for a house in Elk Grove. And we we were looking for houses under 500. And he was kind of getting like, we, we weren't having too much luck with it, right? So I talked to a friend of mine from Lennar, called me up and said, hey, we have this community coming out. Um, Essentia and they're single family homes. And so I drove over there. And of course, the new home companies never market really well. Well, they don't really have to right now. So I saw this come in and it was like, I think, I think, I don't know what he, it, when he got into his house, it appraised for like $60,000 over what he put in for it. And it was under like $500,000, like four bedroom, two and a half bath in Elk Grove, 757. I mean, it was so great. And uh, him and his wife moved in there. The coolest couple, like, so cool. Like, I will tell you one thing, and I'm not even just saying this. My clients, my friends, the people I work with are the best. Like, there's just nothing. They're, they're awesome. The people I work with are great. Like, honestly, like, you know, like it, I tell people this all the time. I'm like, you know, I'm not even a big fan of getting like, you know, Aaron, you and I talk about it. This The business that I have, my team, we work purely on social media, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. Those are the clients, the friends, the subscribers we work mm -hmm. with for everything. Um, and I even turn down referrals that come outside of this just because I love working with people that are watching this channel, understanding the content we're putting out there and providing value. But not only that, that we have a general connection. So for me, when I take out people to see houses or to talk to them about you know, their situations, whether or not it involves making a deal, I really, really love. And like, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if I've ever met better people than the clients that I found through YouTube. So for me, man, I am super grateful to everyone, even, you know, my buddy who I owe a champagne bottle to. And I own a couple actually. I had Raj over at Beezer. I got to go over there and get you one. Um, also, here's another thing that, that I'm going to shout out today too. And this is for Aaron. I'm going to shout this one out. Aaron's company is so, how can I say this? So focused on customer service, they actually brought in another team member. That's right. So they have like three amazing people. They got Sarah, they got Jen, of course they got Aaron. I mean, they're, they're just freaking awesome. So tell us about this new, new, new way persona. Yeah. So Mara today uh, was her first day and basically Mara's, uh, you know, coming into her official job title is executive assistant, but she's basically going to be helping us with all sorts of, of marketing initiatives and also improving our, our client experience. You know, just like anything, you know, in life, it's all about communication, right? And so the, the better you can communicate, the more you can communicate, the more information that can be provided throughout the, the process, the better experience everybody's going to have. So um, Mara is going to be key to just taking us to the next level of, of just, you know, we already, uh, you know, average a, a five star experience. You know, when when we you know send out our client reviews afterwards, it's 99.9% .9 of the time, it's a five star. Everybody's always a raving fan about things, but we want to, you know, take it to six stars, even though that doesn't exist. But I mean, just leave no room for, for improvement, you know, that, that constant uh, Kaizen uh, mindset. And so Mara's uh, really, uh, really going to help us get there. Very excited. We worked with Mara in the past. And so, you know, one of the things that I've learned is you know, you can kind of teach anybody to, to do anything, but it's hard to find, you know, the right uh, personality fits and the right people that have drive and all that stuff. And Mara is just such an awesome person. So uh, just really excited to have her on the team. Yeah. And that's one of the things too, about like the team they put together new way too. It's not just like anyone, Hey, we're, it's like, they're really, really good about bringing in the right fits to what they have going on there. Um, like I said before, if like Aaron is like on the phone with another client, I go right to Jen. If Jen's on, with, on the phone with someone, I go to Sarah and I, we got another one. So it's, it's awesome. Like that's the type of stuff that I love. And that's, that's one of the things about working with new way that I, I do love. I mean, like there is something to be said about just showing up. Do you know what I mean? Like, and that's what we like to do on my team for our clients as well. Like, you know, no matter how late it is, no matter mm -hmm. how stressed out you are, you know, and many of you have talked to me and you've probably gotten the same thing that I tell everyone is I'm like, if you're stressed out about it, I should be stressed out about it, or I should be able to calm you down and tell you why that's not something you should be stressed out about. And it's great to work with a company like New Way because they're the same 
way. I mean, oh my God, a funny story. So I'm like, so Aaron was, I think, on the phone with the client. So I had to hit Jen and Jen's like, I'm at, I'm at dinner with my friends. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, she's like, but the movie's over. So what's going on? What's going on? It was like that type of service is is crazy now i'm gonna tell you why because right now the market is crazy so a lot of people you know when you're talking to realtors or lenders or whatnot a lot of them are like you know doing great they've got a great business fantastic business so the customer service has kind of gone uh gone out the window and you know it was it was good to line up with a company like new way because customer service for them is a priority growth development creating ways to help you know, to be better for our clients. And that's why like Aaron's here every Monday. That's why I'm here every Monday as well, because we believe that the best way to, you know, because the market is doing well, the best way to do that is create an infrastructure that benefits our clients more going forward. Right. Mm -hmm. The idea is of creating something and experience so that it's something that isn't as stressful. It's something that if we see things in the industry that are like, you know, no one's doing, we like to implement them. Um, you know, one of the things is like these lives that we do, we know that at times it can be a little nerve wracking or it can be one of those things where you feel like if you connect with a realtor or a, or a mortgage broker, you're going to get a bazillion calls, emails, they're going to be nagging you. Who knows who's going to be calling you after that fact? And so that's one of the reasons why we also do these lives because it gives you a little ways of being anonymous, asking some questions, and mm -hmm. then just kind of feeling us out. You know what I mean? Just kind of figuring out if we're the right fit based on questions, you know? Yep. And you know, like one of the things that always kills me is when I see a lot of realtors out there, mortgage people, and they're just like, you know, they're doing the mindless scripts. Like, you know, hi, today, the more, you know, it's like, we're not, man, this is it. What you see is what you get. You you throw the, down the questions and we're going to try our best to answer them. And if we don't know them, guess what? We're going to tell you, hit us offline and we're going to do our best to research them and figure it out, you know? Yeah. So this is, this is kind of cool. So anything else going on, Aaron? Anything else in this world? Where are interest rates going, my friend? You know, I I, th I think uh, at some point here we're going to see them go up. the uh, The Feds again have started talking about ta tapering is the term that they're using. Tapering the mortgage backed security and bond purchasing that's been done, but they haven't said like, "Hey, we're going to do it on this date," or "Hey, we're going to do it by this much." They just keep mentioning it in different comments, and so. Every time they do that, we do see, you know, the the mortgage rates kind of tick up a little bit and like they did today, we lost about 20 basis points today. But it wouldn't surprise me if I show up tomorrow and things kind of settle back up a, a bit. So um, for the time being, I think we're going to be in like a really low environment. But, you know, if you're looking six, 12 months down the road, I think it's very possible that, you know, rates in the threes versus rates in the twos is going to be a, a reality. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I'd, I'd love to see rates in the twos forever. But at some point, you know, the music's got to stop. Yeah, I mean, you know, pretty soon they'll just be like, you know, giving away money, just like wrapping it and whoever wants can take it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's going to be an interesting road. I mean, as far as what the market's going to deliver. I mean, I always go back to what my dad said a long time ago to me. He's like, the market goes up, the market goes down. I love my house. And yep. I think there is something to be said about that. I think if you're looking online and you're thinking about making a move, I would say research it, you know, not like you have to jump, but at least you might be ready to jump, you know, get everything in order. You know, I was shopping yesterday with, um, with a really awesome couple and they were looking at like 1.2, 1.3 million home, dollar homes. And they had already got pre-approved for 1 million. And I talked to them and I'm like, you know, look, here's the thing for me, you know, if you're ready for 1.3, 1.2, that's great. But for me as, as your realtor, I don't want to show you something and then get you scrambling for it. You know, it's always good when you're looking for a home to be specific, know what you want, have all your ducks lined up, right? Have everything ready to go. Um, and really, if you see something you like, be ready to jump on it. But know also that you don't have to unless you find that really special house. Like I always tell my clients too, you know, when you walk into a house, you're going to know right away. Never let the house try to, you, you know, you you try to make the house fit you. 
you know what I mean? You have to kind of like vibe out the house. The house has to work, right? And it's like, if you convince yourself that the house is going to work, the house is going to work. Oh, no, no, it's good. No, you know, I think we can make it work. That's not the right house for you. And like I said, I'm babbling a little bit right now. I had a Starbucks nitro cold brew, but I will tell you this, <laughs> like in this market, even though it's softening, interest rates are great. Inventory is slowly coming back. Working with a lender to have them in your back pocket so you could go anytime. Working with a realtor and knowing specifically what you want. If you're looking at all, even a little bit in this market, that would be for me at least your first step. That's a good solid first step. That way you're not one of these people that said, you know what, I could have bought in September, but like now I'm buying next like March, interest rates are at three, five. And, you know, I'm buying less of a house and I wish we would have got myself ready. doesn't take too much. doesn't take too much to get ready to buy. Mm -hmm. Any parting words, my friend, before we're out? You know, I, I just uh, re remind everybody to check in on uh, on Wednesday. Uh, you know, after uh, after your show's over, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, basically buying a house in the middle of changing your job. Um, how to navigate that, the, the pitfalls and all that. We're seeing a lot of people, you know, especially with folks moving out of the Bay Area and all that stuff, a lot of job changes. So we're going to touch on that on our show. Very, very cool. And on Wednesday, 530, I'm going to actually be talking. We're going to do a Sacramento real estate breakdown. We're going to talk about what the market looks like today in comparison to what I keep referring to about three months ago in the frenzy buying market. So you're going to see exactly what is going on in today's market as of Wednesday, pretty much on the nose at 530. So I'm awesome. going to pull together some statistics. We're going to go over it. And we're going to show you exactly what the market looks now, like now. So if you're in someone in Sacramento and you're thinking about selling your home, that's a good video for you. If you're someone from the Bay Area moving into Sacramento or thinking about it, good time to pay attention. Bring your questions. I will bring the answers and we will go over some statistics and find out exactly where the market is now compared to where it was three months ago and where it might even be going to in three months from now. That's it, guys. This is Sacramento Real Estate, and we are out. Guess what, guys? The video just ended. But don't worry. We have more videos just like that one right over there. And if you missed that red subscribe button during the course of the video, we got you covered right there. Hit that subscribe button. We promise to bring you some amazing content. We won't let you down. Now, if you're looking for a team in the Sacramento metro area to work with, we'd love to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. We always include a Zoom link down below. So book a time where we can talk to you a little one-on-one, -on -one, find out exactly what your real estate needs are.